Galatians chapter 1, starting in verse 6, says this, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel to you contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed, as we have said before. And so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be recursed. Go ahead and open up your Bibles. We're going to get there after a little bit, but open your Bibles up to Luke chapter 14. If you don't have a Bible, um, there's some available in the rows. So go open up to to Luke. I just read from Galatians, but open up to Luke chapter 14. We'll get there after a little bit. But today, I want to talk about cheap grace or a cheap gospel, a Dollar General budget version, knockoff dupe version. I think we've all seen people who are walking around with knockoffs, right? Um, knockoff Rolexes, right? Knockoff Rolexes, people walk around with those, are trying to say that they have a Rolex. Granted, it keeps the same time, but we've seen knockoffs. But today I want to talk about kind of a knockoff cheap gospel. But before I do that, one of the things that becomes glaringly obvious to me is this. The number one obstacle for me today is familiarity. Everyone in here at this point has heard the gospel to some level. The challenge, however, for today is for us to hear it with new ears. Because, as we've been going through the Experiencing God Bible study, and talking about what it takes to actually get into relationship with God, one of the preconditions to that relationship is the true gospel. And we, as a church, we as individuals, need to be very dedicated, very honest, and very open to seeking out the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I don't want us to assume that that is an easy task. C.J. Mahaney, a pastor, says this about the gospel. Never be content with your current grasp of the gospel. The gospel is life-permeating, world-altering, and universe-changing truth. It has more facets than a diamond. Its depths man will never exhaust. So, I hope that the gospel is not old, stale, and musty. But in today, I hope that we can breathe new life into the gospel and the good news. Today, I want us all to realize that Jesus' calling in our life is a call for our life. The Apostle Paul, who wrote the book of Galatians, wrote 13 books in the New Testament. In every single one of those books, whether it's to churches or to individuals... He emphasizes and stresses to be on guard, to be watching out for false gospel, for false teaching. He's fighting against it in every single letter he wrote. Now, when Paul wrote those letters, it was somewhere between 50 and 80 A.D., What that means is there are people who are walking around. The apostles were alive. People who were there at Pentecost were alive. People who had met Jesus were alive. People who were healed by Jesus were alive. The daughter of the centurion who was healed by Jesus was alive. But still yet, the church had to fight false teaching and a false gospel. What I have come to find is that it is more normal than it is an outlier to stray off. So before we get going today, what I want us to do is to realize this. Let's not beat ourselves up because we we serve a God of grace. 
But also let us be honest with ourselves. Let us be honest with the word of God. And let it cut like a double-edged sword. And to show you that it's more normal to get off course than we want to think. I want to take a quick walk through the Old Testament. Or not through the Old Testament. I do that a lot. Take a walk through church history. Because I think it's interesting for us to take a look at what has happened before that led us to here. Because oftentimes we operate in a fishbowl. Right? A fish doesn't know it's in a fishbowl until it's pulled out of the water. And we're swimming around in a fishbowl oftentimes. In in 2023, in our lives, where we're at now, the experiences we're having now, the cultural conversations we're having now, the things that we're wrestling with right now. And we don't understand that there's a whole heap of history behind us. Thousands of years of history behind us. So, I will do my best to keep this short. I have been... Yeah. Just the history part. I have been worried because... I get a little excited about church history. So, like, shout out if it's too long. So, Jesus dies. You have the early church. Then you have persecution hit. Then you have the diaspora of the Jews. They're they're dispersed from Jerusalem and they're sent out of the Christians because of the persecution. And churches are popping up everywhere. Then the first generation dies. Then Nero, emperor of Rome, fiddles while Rome burns. He needs a scapegoat and he blames the Christians. So now, huge mass persecution hits the church. Nero is having garden parties at his house where the lights of the garden party are lanterns of Christians being burned. Real persecution is happening. You hear stories of people going to the Colosseum and the like. Christians who are eaten down by lions, who are, who are put to fire... And they're done doing that while singing. St. Cecilia is one who famously went to the stake singing hymns and praises to God. The reason I bring all of this up is because it's really easy at that moment to know who is committed to Christ. But then Charlemagne pops up. Charlemagne is the king. And towards the end of his life, he makes Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire. Now Christianity is not illegal. You're not being killed for it. You're not being burned alive for it. So now the church is facing something it's never faced before. How do you know if someone's really a disciple of Christ? How do I know whether they're actually committed to the gospel? And so what ends up happening is, you have to realize it's real human beings with real issues, with real stories, with real families, And they have to come up with, how do we manage this? How do we come up with this? How do we figure this out? And so what ends up happening is, you have men and women who feel this call to emulate the kind of sacrifice that the early church had. But you don't have that because of the law. So what ends up happening is, you create a dichotomy within the church. You have a split in the church called the high road and the low road. The low road is normal lay people who are attending church. And then you have the high road, and that high road becomes the monastic movement. The monastic movement is the movement of monasteries, right? Monasteries are where monks and nuns live. They, they would separate themselves out. But before that happened, you had the early church fathers, like St. Ignatius or St. Anthony in, in Africa, And what was going on is they said, I need to deprive myself of things in this world so that I can feel that commitment to Christ. So they go and they're hermits in the desert, living in caves. One of my one of the craziest ones to me is there was a guy that he built a pillar and he put a platform on top of it. The first one was too short. People could get to him too easy. So he made it 10 foot tall and it's a 10 foot square and he tied himself to it. That doesn't track with us today. That doesn't sound like Christianity to us today. But to them, they're wrestling with, how do we know if we're committed and how do I know if I'm committed? Okay? But what ends up happening is this monastic movement continues to go. And it's going like wildfire. It actually is forming Europe in the modern world. Towns are popping up around the the monasteries. Hospitals and schools are formed because of them. One of the biggest things that happens and benefits to our modern world is because of the church. But... 
because we're human and because it's more normal to drift than it is to not, what ends up happening is people come in who aren't trying to be super dedicated to Christ, but instead they see that there is power to be gained or there is influence to be gained or there's a hierarchical structure that they can grow up. And so they were being committed to that. Then a guy named Martin Luther shows up many years later. And Martin Luther lived in a monastery, and he was a monk, and he had done all of the things that you do in a monastery. But then in the monastery, he felt called out to the world. And he got called out to the world trying to take the gospel to them. And what happened because of the split of the high road, the low road, the Catholic Church, the whole church is Catholic Church up to this point, except for the Eastern Orthodox, which is a whole other beast. What ends up happening is the Catholic Church has your priests, your nuns, your monks. And you have the lay people who are illiterate and can't read. How do you deal with that? So what you do is you put it in the hands of very few who can, who can teach from the scriptures how things are run. How, what, the, what the Bible is actually teaching. Because you want to safeguard against false teaching. But what happens is they get this ivory tower mentality of separation. Okay? And Martin Luther says, no, we need the democratization of the gospel in the word. Because Gutenberg printing press has come out. We need to get the Bible in common tongue, not in Latin and not in Greek and not in Hebrew. It needs to be in people's languages and it needs to be read for them. And there's a fight that breaks out in the church. A war breaks out. Many people die. Because for the first time ever, you have a real split in the Catholic Church, where it's the Catholic Church and Protestantism. Am I taking too long in the history, or are you guys finding this interesting? I find this stuff interesting. So, you have a split called Protestantism, where you have Lutherans, and you have the Catholic Church. And then, what happens now? Now, how can I know if someone's committed? It's by right theology. Do you answer the questions right? Because you have the way the Catholic Church answers it, and you have the way the, the, the Lutherans, and the Presbyterians, and the Baptists, and the Methodists. And you have all these splits because they're all answering the questions separately. Because now, how do I know if someone's committed? It's not tying myself to a post. It's if I have right theology. We tracking? So then, what happens... That's called the Reformation Movement. The church is reformed. Okay? But then, what ends up happening is, you have different theologies popping up all over the place that are wrestling with key theological issues and ancillary ones. Right? Key ones, like how does God call people? And key ones, like how does God work? And how does baptism work? But then there's also other ones that are out there that are splitting off for any kind of disagreement where you have... The third Presbyterian, second of Irish North. Right? And we see that still today. And so, when that fight broke out and you have Protestantism, you have people who have taken this idea of, how do I know if I'm committed? And you have a, a pop-up of the Puritan movement. The Puritan movement is a pendulum swing. A pendulum swing of, what do my works earn me? How do I know if I'm committed? Well, you know you're committed by your works, by your outward signs, right? Because James says, show me a faith without works and I'll show you a dead faith. So they just go all in on outward signs. In the Puritans, in the Anabaptists, and actually some backgrounds and denominations that are very popular just a few miles west of here end up honing in on that. Okay, And then, you have the restoration movement come, which is what our church is. I don't know if any of you ever heard this. I'm not going to harp on this for too long. Walnut Grove Christian Church is a non-denominational Stone Campbell movement church. Stone Campbell, Barton Warren Stone, Alexander Campbell. In the early 1800s in Cane Ridge, Kentucky, there's a revival that breaks out. That revival breaks out. The Holy Spirit is there. There's a revival that happens for multiple days. The ground is shaking. People are passing out. It's nuts. And what ends up happening is the non-denominational church comes out and they say, we need to get away from all these things that divide us. We need to go by Christian alone. So that's why it's Wanna Grow Christian Church, 
not Wanna Grow Baptist Church, Methodist Church. He said, we don't need titles in front of it. We're Christian, Christian alone. That's good enough. And that's the heart behind this church. That's how in 1889, people started meeting across the street at a revival that became a church. I don't know if any of you knew that. I love this stuff. But to get back to what we're talking about. You have this pendulum swing of the Puritans that's heavy on works. Right? If, I'm not, if, if my works aren't in order, then I'm not in the right gospel. And what always happens because we're human is the pendulum swings the other direction. Whoops. You have the hellfire and brimstone sermons of the 1800s. Man in the hands of a fearful God comes out. It hits all over the place. The guy's preaching it all over. But then what ends up happening is the pendulum swings over here from heavy works to hyper grace. Now, hyper grace is this. Sin, 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 sin. Jesus is enough. And what happens out of that movement and the pendulum swing is in the mid 1900s on into today, what we see is the bar of entry being lowered. So what I mean by that is the bar of entry to be a follower of Jesus Christ going lower and lower. Why? Why did people choose to do that? Because we want people saved. We want people baptized. We want disciples of Christ. But it's really hard when you go all in on the Puritan stuff. So how do we do this? And the pendulum swung. I have found this. This is not in my notes. I have found there is beauty and tension. Oftentimes, man goes to the extremes. We go off to this side or this side, but there's beauty in the tension. Okay? And so, our seeker-sensitive, friendly churches that are lowering the bar, trying to get as many people, I'm going to say, get as many people wet as possible, right? Baptized. Get as many people wet as possible and sitting in our chairs, But what we need to do is we need to realize that, okay, we have this history. It's more normal to get off course than it is to not. So what does the Bible say? One of my favorite questions Jesus ever asked was to Peter. And he said, who do you say that I am? What does the Bible say? Because I see this hyper grace, this this seeker sensitive church. And then I see Jesus talking like in Luke 14, right? Let me do this. So in Luke 14, Jesus is is addressing his believers. Mm -hmm. Let me find it. Because I have an ad lib here. All right, here we go. Sorry, I'll just read it. It says this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother... And his wife and his children and his brothers and sisters. Yes, even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation, it is not able to be finished. And all who see it mock him, saying, This man began to build but was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first, deliberate whether he will be able with his 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20? And if not, while the other is yet far off, he, he will send a delegation and ask for terms of peace. So, therefore, anyone who does not renounce all he has cannot be my disciple. That does not sound like a low bar of entry. You don't have to turn here, but Matthew chapter 7 verse 12 says this. This is Jesus speaking in the Sermon on the Mount. He's closing out the sermon and he says this. So in everything you do, what you have, wait, wait, wait. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life. Only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. 
Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. Jesus' is calling in our life is a call for our life. This is not a low entrance bar. This sermon is going to be two parts. I'm going to preach next week and I'm going to dive more into some of this. But what I want you guys to realize is this. We have this cheap grace, this cheap version knockoff. But what is the real gospel? And what I want us to wrestle with is what is the gospel that we've heard? Because I think... Me growing up and me trying to get my head around the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, the angelion of Jesus Christ, right, is tainted by some of the things I heard in the past. Because God doesn't want and Christ doesn't want us to do things out of blind obligation. He wants us to do things and be obedient to Him out of a deep-rooted respect and love for who He is in Jesus Christ and who God is and what He has done for us while we were still sinners. And the wrestling that we have to do is what does the gospel require of us? The Puritans answered it with works. What does the gospel require of us? And as I was preparing this week, I found this video of Vadi Bachman. He's a preacher. I really like him. Let's go ahead and listen to what he has to say about the gospel. Now, all the gospel requires is repentance and faith. That's it. Nothing else. I pause there intentionally. Because some of you are really uncomfortable right now because you're going, well, what about obedience? That's not what the gospel requires. It's what the gospel produces. If the gospel were to require obedience from us, then that would mean that we could be obedient apart from the person and work of Christ and Jesus died for nothing. The gospel produces obedience in us, joyful obedience in us. And again, if we get these things mixed up, that's where we end up in legalism and moralism and works righteousness. And that's when the good news is really not good news at all. It becomes burdensome. If the gospel that we heard is burdensome, we have heard the wrong gospel. If the God that we worship is taking away the marks of your sin and waiting for you to mess up, you have the wrong gospel. If the gospel that you believe simply requires church attendance, church participation, you have the wrong gospel. If the gospel you believe leads to division, leads to hate, leads to malice, judgment, you have the wrong gospel. Why? Because that is not Jesus. That in no way is what Jesus taught. If anyone would be my disciples, they must deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow me. Do you want to be Jesus' disciple? That is the question. Because I can tell you right now, I can keep you busy. I have sign-up sheets. I have Bible studies, I have things that need printed out, and need cut it, I cut out, I need grammar checks, I need websites updated, I have emails that need sent. I have meetings you can attend. Please take some of my meetings. I can do all of those without Christ. And so can you.
God gave us free will to choose whether to love him or not. And in the gospel, the good word, the good news is that every man and woman has fallen short. And it created a chasm between ourselves and God that we could no longer have relationship with God the way he desired. Therefore, God sent his only son to die on the behalf of many that we may be reconciled to the Father right here and right now and on into eternity. And that is the good news, friends. That whatever these hands have brought, whatever these feet have done, whatever this heart has done, whatever this mouth has said, whatever this brain has thought, Christ died for it to redeem it. And so we respond in obedience Not because we're earning anything, but because it's all been earned. And so we obey because our Father loves us. And we ought love Him. Hear the gospel for the first time. The God of the universe who created every blade of grass you've ever walked on, every breeze you've ever felt, everything you've ever seen, loves you. He is a lover of your soul. And that love should constrain you to obedience. Why? Because he loves us. Because he loves me. In spite of me. He knows I'm going to fall short and he loves me. He knows I suck and he loves me. I have a lot more. What we do by soft paddling the gospel, by making it low admittance, by saying, come as you are, which is true. That's the problem. Oftentimes, the things we go astray in are on truths, but not whole truths, not nothing but the truth. So help us, God. Because what happens is this. You can come as you are. But don't stay that way. Because the gospel is life bringing. It's world changing. It's universe exploding. Because God doesn't want you to settle for who you are right now. Because who I am right now sucks. Who I am right now creates division. Who I am right now says things that hurt. Who I am right now breathes life, or breathes death. But God breathed life into my lungs, and therefore I am to breathe life into creation. And life into those I come in contact with. But I don't, always. I am not perfect, and neither are you. Sorry if you're just now hearing that. The last half hour has been hard then. Because here's what happens. Jesus gives us commands like, don't be anxious. And we walk around like a ball of anxiety mess. The only thing that's going to cure it is going to see the chiropractor to get rid of that knot in my neck because that's where I'm carrying it. The Bible tells us, do not worry or be afraid. I heard someone say this once. 24-hour news, Fox News and CNN, MSNBC, choose your poison of choice, is the Bible of the fearful. Now, I'm going to tiptoe here. There is a war breaking out right now. How many hours have we spent watching news coverage How many hours have we spent thinking about that in the past three days? And what is the emotion that's bringing to us? Is it worry? Is it anxiety? Is it fear? If it is, that ain't gospel, folks. Because our God is a God of boldness. Our God is a God of freedom. Our God is a God of love. And I know there is pain in this world. 
And there are people dying in this world right now. And I know there are atrocities happening right now. That there are people who are breathing their last right now. But somehow our gospel has to be big enough for a God that is love and all-powerful to bring justice to that. Because our Christ says, I am that I am. I am the life. I am the way. I am the truth. Darkness hides from me, and the kingdom of hell trembles before me, because it has been defeated. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And that is the gospel. That is the heart of what we do at Walnut Grove, because we come here because Christ called us for our lives. Quit segmenting. If the gospel says, I have secular things over here, and I have I have spiritual things over here. You're wrong gospel. It's all inclusive. It's an all inclusive resort, baby. And the meal isn't just that. You can feed on the bread, the word of God. And so I encourage you. Seek the true gospel. Why? Because we sit here churning our wheels as Christians going, why am I not growing in Christ likeness? Why can't I do this stuff? Why am I not? Why am I not doing these things? We're going to talk about that next week. But the heart of it is because the gospel we have has not led us to obedience. It has not led us to good fruit. And we want to be people who bear good fruit. Do not settle for cheap grace. One of my favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis, and I have a lot. is that God has offered us a holiday at the sea to go and swim in the waves. Yet we settle for mud pies in the dirt. Let us not settle for mud pies. Let us not settle for cheap imitation. Let us lean into who Christ is with boldness, with freedom, because he loves us. Let us build our lives on that foundation. Because all other foundations are what? Sinking sand. Let the waves come. Let the storms come. But let us build on the rock. 